There were fewer students in class than usual since it was a Friday morning, and I'm sure many of them started their day off last night at the local bars. I always wondered about the wisdom of the schedule makers scheduling an advanced economics course at 8 a.m., especially if the class was on a Friday. Why not schedule a freshman economics class for 8 a.m., since these students were under 21 and unless they had a fake ID, they couldn't drink on a Thursday night? Absenteeism would be much lower in freshman courses, but that would be too logical. In the real world I live in, those in power seem to pride themselves on not being too logical. It doesn't matter if it's politics, big business, or a big university in the Midwest. Once someone becomes the power that be, he or she must leave their common sense at the door. Like many people, I was one of those guys who started my weekend on Thursday night. I was the king of parties. I had decent grades, but I never put much effort into my studies. I learned what I needed to, but I didn't feel like I had to impress anyone with my grades. Yes, I later realized that some recruiters were paying attention to this, but, oh well, I always proved to my bosses that I was more than qualified for the actual job. And then I started teaching, got a master's and a PhD in economics, and ended up teaching some of our brightest young minds. I was an assistant professor for the last two years, made good money, had a great schedule, and life was good. My wife was a mid-level bank executive who took a few years off while our kids were babies and returned to work when they both started school. My son, Jeremy, is nine years old, and my daughter, Sandy, is seven years old. My 10 hour a.m. morning class was a freshman class, and it was well attended. This was my favorite class to teach because at 18, most of these kids were like sponges, ready to soak up knowledge. Additionally, there were several students in the class who were not economics majors, as most majors required economics as a required freshman class. I really enjoyed instilling basic concepts in journalism and history students who I heard complaining about having to study economics in general. All I need to know is how to write, not how to decide how to spend money, I heard one of my journalism students say at the beginning of the semester. Hell, you can't be any journalist today if you don't understand basic economics. My one evening class was also an advanced class, but since it started at 1 water p.m., the undergrads and undergrads did show up, although most of them were hung over. But for this class, they were the best of the best intellectually. So even with a hangover, most of them were probably functioning better mentally than most of the general population. It was a great challenge to teach these kids, especially because I was one of those journalists when I started about a hundred years ago. There are never any students coming into the office for help on a Friday afternoon, so as usual I went home around 3. The kids showed up at about 3.30, and after a few minutes of laughing and goofing around, we started making dinner on Friday night. This was our daily routine, and we enjoyed each other's company while preparing for my wife's arrival at about 5.30. We would usually cook a pretty big dinner, and the four of us would celebrate the week as a family before the crazy weekend began. Tracy walked in around her usual time. The kids both squealed and ran up to hug her. I stood behind, watching and smiling, waiting for my turn. She was wearing a dark blue business suit, nothing fancy. But I stopped breathing for a second when I first saw her. It didn't matter what she was wearing. She always gave me that reaction the first time I saw her after the breakup. She was simply stunningly beautiful, at least to me. After she kissed and hugged the babies, she came to me and we kissed passionately, as we always do after any separation. Please, you two, get a room, said my son, who always looked visibly uncomfortable whenever Tracy and I got physically intimate in any way. Ah, the innocence of a nine-year-old. Tracy was the same age as me, 35, 5'5", five, five, beautiful and smart. She had long blonde hair, piercing blue eyes, and despite having given birth to two children, her figure was probably still more than beautiful. She attended our gym regularly and rode her bike 20 to 30 miles a week. I was an incredibly lucky man. And then the world came crashing down on me. Since it was the weekend, the kids had to go to bed before 10. After they went to bed, Tracy and I lounged on the couch for a while. After a few minutes, we were both naked and had to stop and move into the bedroom so we could at least close the door. An hour later, we were huddled together, breathing heavily, both sweating. 
God, how I loved this woman and how I loved loving her. Roger, are you still awake? Roger? I was hugged behind Tracy, and she could feel my steady breathing, indicating that I was either asleep or not far away. I perked up a little when she spoke. I'm awake, babe. What do you need? Almost the greatest show of love you could ever give me, she replied softly. Now I was intrigued and woke up. You know how depressed Karen was about not being able to have children with Dave, especially since he's the last man in his family tree, right? She began. Do you want to talk about it now? I asked. I was more than puzzled. Karen is Tracy's little sister, three years younger to be exact. She was told that, unless it was a miracle, she would not have children. Her husband, Dave, a guy I don't really like, has some royal Hungarian blood and thinks he needs to have male offspring to continue acting like royalty. She just goes to work, comes home, and mopes around the house. I offered to consult with her, but she did not agree to it. It's getting really bad. Well, we think we've found the answer to her depression and the end of Dave's family. I'm carrying the baby for them. At that moment, I sat down. I'm pretty sure my mouth was open. Looks like we actually discussed this. Wait, what? You know she can't practically produce viable eggs and probably wouldn't be able to carry to term even if she could produce eggs. But I can produce eggs, and I have two children to prove that I can carry. Full term. I love my sister very much, Roger, and for her sake I could carry another child. It will be their child, hers and Dave's, but I am carrying it for them. That means no sex. At least no vaginal sex until I'm confirmed pregnant. I'll have to stop taking birth control until then, and we can't risk you becoming a father instead of Dave. It could take a few weeks, maybe a few months. Stop, break, I interrupted. Intrauterine insemination immediately. What are you talking about? The answer hit me like a brick to the head, and as the realization sank in, Tracy lowered her eyes. You mean have sex with Dave? What are you talking about? It's a way to connect us all. Tracy explained. Karen and I don't want to be clinical. We want it to be about love. Karen will be in the room with us. And I'm sure Dave is not against this decision at all, I screamed. Well, he agreed with us, but it was a decision we all made, Tracy replied. It was a decision you all made. No one asked my opinion, I blurted out. How can this be about love for me? I was already standing next to the bed at this time. In fact, I was walking back and forth. I might agree with you carrying a child for them, but I don't agree with you having sex with Dave, even if Karen is in the room. That won't happen. I don't care if it makes Karen happy or if Dave's line continues. It won't happen. Tracy looked at me like I was a petulant child, slowly shaking her head from side to side. It's not something that love can't overcome, honey. Once you get over your initial jealousy, we can go back to our relationship. Nothing has to change. It will just be sex. And I know you love Karen and Dave, and they will be forever happy and grateful. My mom and dad are so excited they can barely contain themselves. Have you discussed this with your parents yet? Everyone seems to agree, except for your soon-to-be cuckolded husband. Am I to understand? It won't be like this, Roger. Once I get pregnant, it will be just you and me. You're the only one I love. Don't make it more than it is. You always trust me when we disagree on big issues. You always let me make the final decision, and haven't things worked out well for us? It's a lot more than letting you buy a brown sofa for the living room, or choosing to go on vacation to Hawaii instead of Brazil, I said. For some reason you think my opinion was unnecessary, but that won't happen if you expect to stay married. Think about it a little more, and I am sure you will accept my way of thinking. Next week is the most fertile. I was stunned, to say the least. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep, so I turned on the light, got dressed, and left the house without saying a word. My favorite watering hole remained open until two o'clock, and instead of taking a seat at the bar as usual, I ordered a double Jameson and took it back to the table at the back of the bar. I downed my first glass in about ten minutes, looked into the eyes of Carol, the bartender, and raised my glass again. Instead of the waitress bringing me my drink, Carol served me herself, asking if I was okay. Carol and Archie Migrant have owned the Cluster Cluck Bar and Grill for about 20 years, and with all that experience, 
Carol could probably be called a certified psychologist. She had known me for about 12 years, and all she had to do was look at my face to know something was wrong. Her question wasn't really a question. It was more of a statement of fact, and she expected a straight answer from me. I couldn't lie to Carol and gave it up in the next few minutes. She looked at me carefully and smiled tiredly. She looked at Archie, who had replaced her at the counter, and raised a finger. Archie came over with a cup of coffee for Carol, nodded at me, and walked quietly back to the bar. You realize you've got a big mess here, Roger, she said. Ever since I've known you two, you've always given Tracy her way. She believes that it is her right to make the final decision. If you don't put your foot down, she'll decide she can do what she wants, and you'll give her tacit approval, as usual. She'll have sex with that guy until she gets pregnant, then you'll have to carry the baby for the next nine months. Then she'll probably just repeat the process in the future since you already agreed once, and perhaps in the future. Oh, damn, I whispered. Yes, in the very near future, you will have to make difficult choices, so you need to think carefully about everything. Right before the last call, I had one more take, and then I went home. I could probably drink half a bottle and stay sober due to my bad mood. When I returned home, the house was dark. I didn't bother going upstairs to our bedroom. I grabbed a blanket from the closet and crashed into my lazy boy. The next morning, I heard Tracy and the kids laughing in the kitchen. I staggered into the room, still wearing my clothes from last night, and made my way to the coffee pot. Good morning, Sonia. Tracy cooed to me as I walked past. Did Mr. Jameson make things better last night? Are you ready to start your day and become everyone's hero? She knew me so well that she even knew that I would drink when I had to solve a problem. Unsurprisingly, she decided that the matter was probably settled. We didn't talk about Tracy's proposal at all on Saturday, but there was a certain tension in the air. While we were eating on Saturday night, Tracy casually reminded me that we were invited to her parents' house for Sunday dinner the next day. Ha! I don't remember her telling me that before. We left for her parents a little after three o'clock in the afternoon and stopped at about four. As we pulled up in front of Tracy's parents' house, I noticed cars belonging to Dave and Karen and Tracy's two aunts and uncles. I glanced sideways at Tracy and she smiled back at me, like someone who already had the answers to the test she was about to take. The kids ran off to play in the backyard and we adults gathered in the living room. Karen walked slowly towards me, touched my shoulder and looked deep into my eyes. I shook my head slowly, then lowered my eyes. She looked like she was about to cry until she looked at Tracy, who was nodding and smiling. I started to feel uncomfortable. There was a refrigerator stocked with beer in the kitchen and a couple bottles of booze on the counter. I grabbed a bottle of Tirok vodka, threw some ice into the glass, and poured myself the equivalent of two shots. I felt that my life was about to get really interesting. I shouldn't have been surprised that my mother-in-law started all this. I was married to her daughter for 13 years, and she still hated me. I was not who my in-laws wanted Tracy to marry, and they made that clear on multiple occasions. I can't believe you're so selfish as to deny Karen and Dave the chance to have their own child. What kind of idiot are you? Lorraine Tortello practically screamed at me, so they were going to try to lather me up. I didn't expect this to happen. I'm not that selfish, Mom. I agreed that Karen and Dave could borrow Tracy's womb, but there was no reason to have sex. Fertilization is a perfectly healthy way to get this. Ready. I don't see any point in doing anything else. But this is such a clinical approach and is unlikely to be the way our children were conceived with love. We want Karen and Dave's baby to be conceived in love, Tracy replied. We want it to be a loving experience. We? Who are we? I asked. I was never consulted about this. They told me this, but I don't agree with it. I will never agree to this. He doesn't have to make love to you for you to have a child with them. It's about conceiving a child in love, not about Dave and I having that kind of love for each other. Tracy chimed in. Karen will be in the room with us, dear. He's packing, isn't he? I asked as the light bulb went off in my head. Dave grinned at me. Everyone else looked at him. 
If she's going to carry our child, shouldn't she at least have a little fun with it? Karen was crying. Totally wrong answer, Karen, I shouted. So what is it, Tracy, he's gaining nine inches? Dave grinned at me again, nodding his head. Only for the money, old man, he chuckled. So you get a nine-inch tube to enjoy for a while? He has sex with my beautiful wife, Karen gets the baby, and I will be the fucking cuckold. You can't be serious. None of you. This is wrong. I love you, Roger, and only you, Tracy insisted. After I get pregnant, it will be just you and me again, forever. I finished off the rest of the vodka in a glass and stood up. Let me, Karen, and her husband take you home. I suddenly didn't want to eat, I said, heading towards the door. The first few days of the week, it was more than frosty at home. We both talked to the kids, but neither of us said more than a few sentences to the other. Finally, on Wednesday, after we had eaten and washed the dishes and the kids had gone to their rooms to do their own thing, Tracy spoke. Roger, you know I would never do anything that could harm us, our family. I know deep down that this is the right thing to do, and I know that once you overcome your jealousy and fear, you will see it too. And if we don't do this now, in a few years, you will come to me with great regret for ruining everything for Karen and Dave. I'm 35. I only have a small window left to safely carry a child and maybe get my body back after that. I love my sister and brother-in-law, but I'm not going to carry a child for them in my 40s. Then do it at the clinic like everyone else, Tracy. Love is so much more than just a threesome between you, Karen, and Dave, I replied. Nothing like that will happen, Tracy said. Roger, we've been married 13 years. You have to trust me on this, please. I can't do this, Tracy. I will not share you with anyone, not even with my family. If you insist on going through with this, we won't exist anymore. I won't be a part of it. Thursday night after dinner, the four of us sat in our assigned seats in the living room and watched TV. My designated spot was my lazy boy. The children and Tracy were sitting on the sofa. Tracy stood up, walked over to me, and very carefully climbed into the lazy boy with me, actually laying halfway on top of me while I lay there. I moved back a little to make room for her. Five minutes later, she was blowing gently into my ear, and the hand stroking my leg became a little adventurous. She placed her lips on mine and then tried to suck my tonsils. God, could you two get a room, Jeremy said with real disgust on his face. Tracy and I looked at each other then stood up and walked up the stairs to our room. This was not uncommon for us. We were both confident that Jeremy knew what was going on. I'm not sure Sandy knew or understood. However, we tried to remain silent. Neither of us said a word as we got dressed and went downstairs to continue watching TV. Jeremy looked at us in surprise as we descended. The game plan for the next week, according to Tracy, was for her to go straight from work to Dave and Karen's on Friday night and stay there until the following Sunday. On Sunday evening, we had a family reunion. Although I was low-key hoping she would call it off, I made plans with the kids for both weekends. I wanted to spend as much happy time with my kids as possible before I changed their lives forever. On our first big weekend, we visited the Cincinnati Zoo. All the kids knew about Tracy not being with us was that she was helping Aunt Karen and Uncle Dave with a big project at home. The second weekend, we visited the Cleveland Zoo and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, among other things. I used the same excuse that Tracy wasn't with us. By the end of nine days, I looked terrible. I hardly slept at all. We were at home about an hour outside of Cleveland when Tracy pulled into the driveway. The kids ran out of the house to greet her happily, chatting about our wonderful weekend. After she left her bags by the stairs, Tracy came into the living room to greet me, since I didn't greet her as usual. I didn't put the chair down, I didn't get up, and I didn't kiss her. She stood at the foot of the chair for about five seconds, looking at me. My inaction did not go unnoticed by her. So this is how it will be? she asked. Are you really going to play the injured party, Trace? I snapped. Against my expressed wishes, the three of you go on a nine-day sex festival to impregnate his child while I look after our children and pretend everything is fine. This is not love as I understand it. 
How many times have you let him have sex with you? How many times have you given a damn about me and the kids? I wasn't put here to be anyone's punching bag, diss rag, or cuckold. Don't you dare talk to me about love, because if you really loved me, you wouldn't have spent nine days with Dave and Karen. It has nothing to do with love and you know it. You wanted it. You got it. Just don't expect me to sit idly by because of this nonsense. You're wrong about this week because you're afraid of losing me. This won't happen, Roger. Tracy was crying. You are stupid. This has already happened. You chose him over me this week, and you will choose it for me next month if you are not pregnant. What happens if you have a girl? You've already made contingencies. Are you planning to do this again to give him a boy? Apparently, I hit the nail on the head because Tracy flushed red and began scanning the carpet with her eyes. Damn it. How could you do this to us? To me? Our family? Tracy took a few steps back as I scolded her. I had never said anything like that to her before, and I could see the fear of understanding on her face. This problem wasn't going to go away with her pouting face. So you're trying to turn the kids against me by being a fun parent? Tracy asked, trying to change the conversation a little. I shrugged. Tracy's face changed from sadness to anger. She's sleeping with another man, for some reason, and has the courage to be mad at me? Will miracles never stop? My response to Tracy came the next day when she was served at work. When I got home, she was already there, and the manila envelope was sitting on the counter when I walked in the door. The kids greeted me with their dad's homemade mania for about 15 minutes and then left. Tracy watched me the entire time. I was busy with the kids, keeping her distance but keeping a close watch nonetheless. Couldn't wait to get served before I got home? She finally asked with humble sadness in her voice. Because I had very little dealings with the lawyer, it was not my first priority for them to file the motion early. This was the first chance they had to have it awarded. I didn't want to waste extra time. That won't happen, Roger. There will be no divorce. I told you, I love you, and only you. I will not allow you to destroy us, our family, because of your jealousy and selfish insecurities. You'll thank me someday, she said. I exhaled deeply. Jealousy and self-doubt caused by selfishness. God, I love these terms. I believe the best defense is a good offense. At dinner, I explained to the children what was happening. I told them and Tracy that I would be gone by the weekend, but they could still see me whenever they wanted. I think all four of us cried at one point or another. The most poignant moment came when Jeremy asked why I was divorcing Tracy. He's pretty insightful for a nine-year-old, so I figured I'd give him a sanitized version of the truth. We can't be married anymore because Mom broke Dad's heart, I said simply. Jeremy simply nodded. But Mom won't allow a divorce, Tracy intervened. Very soon we will all be a family again. She gave me a smug and confident look. I curled my mouth and gave her an annoyed look. After dinner, I took two large suitcases out of the closet and loaded them with clothes for the week and other things I thought I would need. Tracy looked at me from the doorway with a look that, at best, expressed irritation. We'll still be here when you get over your madness, Tracy said as I grabbed the keys and headed to the car. I kissed both children and told them I loved them. I told them that they would still see me often since I would be there for them. I moved into a small apartment about 15 minutes from our house and continued doing normal dad things like coaching my son's little league team and taking my daughter to dance lessons. Because Tracy fought the divorce so hard, it took almost a year to get it done. Dave's swimmers didn't make it in the first month, so Tracy went for round two a month later. Even though I didn't have room in the apartment for the three of us, the kids and I did the best we could for two more days off treating the time like it was some kind of giant camping trip. When I brought the kids home on Sunday afternoon, Tracy was still not home, so we hung out for a while, as usual. When she finally appeared, we just looked at each other. Well, actually, I stared at her, and she just looked at me like a disappointed parent looks at a failing child. Tracy's pregnancy began to show in her third month. The little bump in the middle of her body brought back memories of better times. They quickly disappeared as anger grew within me that I was not the father of this lump.
At six months, Tracy was quite large, the same as she had been when she carried both of us. I have to admit, I always thought she was incredibly sexy pregnant, and this time was no exception. One day, I brought Jeremy home from batting practice, and Tracy invited me to dinner. Having no other plans, I agreed. After eating, the kids left, but Tracy brought coffee and apple pie, so I sat around for a while. Before I knew it, we were in what used to be our bedroom, and I was running my hands up and down her stomach. Hey, I'm human, and if she was going to put it out there, I would love it. As we came to our senses and were breathing heavily, she looked at me and said, Damn, Raj, that was good. I miss that. Are you sure about this divorce? Don't you still love me? I assumed I would always love you, Tracy. That's the problem. I still love you, but apparently you don't love me enough. That's not true, Roger. Come back home. Let's be a family again, she said. What makes you think I would let you have sex with another man, especially when I told you I wouldn't let that happen? You know me better, babe. Why? She didn't answer, but her blush told me a lot. She honestly thought I was going to give her a hall pass. We made vows, babe, I whispered. You ripped my heart out with your little trick. A couple of months later, I had the kids over for the weekend when Tracy gave birth to, well, technically, Karen and Dave's baby. I didn't ask about it, but the next time I had kids, they told me everything. I pretended to be interested in their new cousin. A week later, I received what I thought was an unexpected phone call from Tracy. What? No flowers? No phone call? Not even a baby gift for your new niece? She said unceremoniously when I picked up the phone. I thought better of you. You apparently think much better of me than I do, I replied. I don't think I can claim to be an uncle in the little that's left of our marriage. And as for sending you flowers, you still don't get it. You can't break my heart and keep all my love. That's not how the game is played. The divorce was finalized a month later. Tracy got the kids, the house, child support, and some alimony for herself because I made more than her. Apparently she made some friends too because I noticed that very few of our friends kept in touch. I didn't notice it at first, but then little things started adding up, like many of the men barely noticed me when we met at kids' events. After several instances of being ignored, I finally got angry enough to ask one of these longtime friends if I had become radioactive or had a problem with my smell. Oh man, you ruined everything with that baby story. How could you be such a selfish bastard? Rick Jensen asked me when I got him talking one night at the Cluster Cluck Bar. So you all and the other guys think I had to become a cuckold just so that bastard Dave could have a baby? I asked in disbelief. Cuckold? What are you talking about, Roger? Just let Tracy carry his baby. If that's what she wants to do, all you have to do is support her and you'll be a real hero. It has nothing to do with being a cuckold at all. Then she's not telling everyone the full story, I said with some irritation. How do you think she got pregnant? The three of them had a little threesome, even though I warned her I'd divorce her if she did. She just doesn't think she could do anything wrong. Damn it! Seriously? he exclaimed. Well, screw it. Looks like a lot of us owe you an apology. Within a few weeks, almost all of our former friends called me to apologize, and suddenly I had a social life again. But things really warmed up for me when the next little league season started. Since I'd always been married before, I never paid attention to all the single moms watching their kids at games. But now that I was single, it seemed like one in three women at games wasn't wearing a wedding ring. I received a new phone number after every game. Tracy didn't show up for Jeremy's first five games of the season, but she was in the stands for game six. I always coached from third base, and as I crossed the field to get back to our dugout at first base, she was sitting about halfway up in the stands, looking more than a little hot in shorts that were probably a little too short and tight for this crowd. I tried my best not to stare, but I know she caught me looking at her great legs. In fact, it seems like she's been watching the way I look at her throughout the game. I knew it was awkward, but I just couldn't help myself. She even winked at me a couple of times, and if I could have, I would have hit myself. We won the game 6-3, and Jeremy hit a couple of shots. Right after the game, I was talking to a couple of parents about heading to the ice cream stand to get some ice cream cones for the kids to celebrate when I noticed Tracy heading towards me. 
I really didn't want to talk to her. But I didn't see a way to avoid it until Jessica Beale came to the rescue. Jessica was the mom of my right fielder, a skinny 10-year-old blonde named Justin. Jessica had been divorced for several years after her husband cheated on her. She was a tall blonde with big breasts and goddess curves, probably the subject of many dreams among all the dads on the baseball field. We talked from time to time, but I didn't really know much about her. But as soon as Tracy approached me, Jessica appeared in front of me as if out of nowhere. Oh, hi, Jess, how are you? I asked, trying not to drool. Justin looked good on the platform today, don't you think? Yeah, he wasn't bad, she replied. Do you have a moment so we can talk? I need to ask you a favor. Well, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I said to the parents I was talking to. How about you come to my office? I pointed to a place off to the side. It turned out that Jessica was the deputy president of one of the banks in the city, and they were soon going to have a summer event. She usually went there alone, she said, but since I was no longer married, she hoped that I would agree to visit him as her companion. Oh, hell yes, I said with a laugh. She smiled back, gave me a business card with her number on it, and leaned over to kiss me on the cheek. As she walked away, I saw her look at Tracy and make a small gesture with her head. I had no idea what that meant. I had a good time with Jessica at an event a few weeks later, and we met up from time to time. I also dated some other woman who approached me at games or practices. Who would have thought there was such a thing as little legu parent bonds? I didn't even pay attention to what was going on around me because my marriage was so great. Luckily for me, I've always kept myself in good physical shape and watched my weight, so at least it wasn't an issue for me, but after 15 years out of the game, the social aspect of dating was difficult. Plus, I knew I was carrying a lot of baggage. I thought I had a perfect marriage with Tracy and was devastated to find out otherwise. At that moment, I wasn't sure if I could ever trust another woman with my heart again. My children were too young to talk about the issue, and at that stage in their lives, I don't think they fully understood the significance of what was happening. Tracy spent a lot of time with Karen and David and their children, and I think both of my children enjoyed the concept of a new baby. I, on the other hand, saw the child as the physical embodiment of Tracy's betrayal, and although the rational part of me knew that the child was not to blame, I still wanted nothing to do with him. The rest of Tracy's family thought the baby was golden, but I was still considered unreasonable. As I expected, Tracy was back at it again and carrying a second child for Karen and Dave. At least she had the decency to appear guilty the few times I saw her over those nine months. Jeremy and Sandy told me she had another girl. I have to admit, I smiled to myself in celebration. Tracy and the kids, and Karen and Dave and their kids, moved into a larger house in the same area. So with my half of the proceeds from the sale of the house Tracy sold, I was at least able to move into a larger apartment, which made it easier for me to deal with children when they stayed with me. Even though we had children together, there were long periods of time when I didn't see Tracy, which was fine with me, and the kids and I didn't talk too much about what they were doing in their house, as I preferred to live in the moment and create my own memories with my kids. So I guess I shouldn't have been too surprised at Sandy's dance recital a couple of years later when Tracy walked in looking like she was pregnant again. She never lost all the weight after her second child with Karen and Dave, and in truth, she looked stocky, uncomfortable, and tired. She must have noticed the surprised look on my face because instead of staying away from me, I think she felt like she needed to explain herself to me. Remember when I said I wouldn't carry a baby for Karen and Dave when I was 40? Well, apparently I lied. They persuaded me to try again to have a boy. I'll be 41 when this baby is born, she said. What you do for love? Yes. I replied with a lot of sarcasm in my voice. Six months later, Tracy gave birth to Karen and Dave's third girl. I admit I poured myself a large glass of Glenmorangi single malt to celebrate. About six months after that, I was sitting with some buddies sampling tequila at the cluck on a Friday night when Karen walked into the bar with a couple of friends. We noticed each other, and I gave her a small wave, then continued talking to my friends as she walked to a table in the back. 
I didn't think much about it until about 90 minutes later when a clearly drunk Karen sat down in the empty chair to my right at the table where my friends and I were drinking. Judging by the fact that she smelled like she was wearing a gin-based perfume, I figured she had at least drunk too many martinis. Thank you so much for ruining my life, you damn boy scout, she said in a voice loud enough for half the bar to hear. If you had just accepted the baby and not divorced my sister, Dave and I wouldn't have gotten a divorce and I wouldn't have ended up with her three brats. Whoa, baby, what the hell are you talking about? I asked defensively. She was just going to get pregnant with his baby, that's all, and then carry the baby. But no, Mr. Scout divorces her and she ends up with me and Dave, and he entertains her about half the time, and what can I say? Nothing, because she's going to give birth to our baby. But tonight I come home from work and they're already in the bag, and he tells her he loves her more than he loves me. So now I'm alone, with three kids running around and a husband who loves my baby sister more than me, his wife of 15 years, and all because you simply didn't let her have sex with him for a week or two. You're a selfish idiot. The bar got pretty quiet as Karen blurted out her story. I was pretty sure everyone was looking at the two of us. I motioned for Carol at the counter to give me another shot of Don Julio and another martini that Karen was drinking. Carol brought us our drinks in record time and advised me to control Karen's outbursts or she would throw her out of the bar. Karen is three years younger than Tracy at 38 and would have compared well in looks and body to my ex-wife until Tracy grew older and had three later children. Karen leaned towards me holding her drink when she apparently decided that the rest of the bar patrons needed to hear the rest of the story, so she began to raise her voice. Caught between a rock and a hard place, I did the only thing I could think of to shut her up. I kissed her. But this is not just a little kiss. I opened my mouth wide enough to match her open mouth, and when I touched her lips, her tongue practically jumped into my mouth. I met this challenge head on, if you will, and responded in kind. Thirty seconds later, we were in my car and heading to my apartment. I have no rational explanation for what followed. Damn it, Roger, do you do this to all your women? Or was this some kind of revenge sex scenario we just played out? It was fucking amazing. Dave had never done anything like this to me before. That was... Thank you. I lay there with Karen curled up on my chest just like Tracy did. I stared at the ceiling, trying to understand why exactly I did what I just did. I'm sure part of it was revenge, but I know part of it was pure lust. I know deep down that I still love Tracy, at least to some extent, and Karen was as close as I could get, without all the baggage. Oh yes, I know there was some baggage here. I had just broken one of my personal codes by knowingly having sex with another man's wife, but I owed Dave less than nothing, and considering that Karen was part of the unholy triumvirate, I had no problem doing it just for my own pleasure. Tracy always said you were a good, generous lover, Karen said as we lay side by side looking at each other. But she never went into detail. I'd say she greatly underestimated you. You know, I meant what I said last night. She was absolutely sure that you would let her have her way. But it was also about love, Roger. Seriously, the three of us have only grown stronger in our love for each other. I knew we were cutting ourselves off from you, but... Dave and Tracy said our love was different from the two of you, and that was normal for us. She was so sure of your love for her. She was so sure that you would never get a divorce. Then when you let it pass, well, it was right that we let her and the kids move in with us. She gave us so much, but the longer she was with us, the more awkward I began to feel. I knew that she was developing feelings for him, and he was developing feelings for her, but I tried not to see it. She gave birth to our children. Karen and I continued to have sex parties every few weeks until her divorce was final six months later. Then, when she and David worked out a schedule for regular visits with the children, she spent entire weekends with me at my apartment on weekends when David had the girls. For both of us, it started almost entirely with sex, but gradually grew into real friendship. I always got along with her when she was my daughter-in-law. Spending the weekend with her gave me a new understanding of who she was. I know it started out as penance for her, but I think we both grew as friends, even though we knew it would never happen again. And then, it had to be something more. About a year later, Karen woke up before me on a Saturday morning after an intense Friday night of sex 
and wandered to the bathroom. I was vaguely aware that she had come out of my bed, since at that moment I was half asleep. The next thing I heard was disgusting noises coming from the bathroom, so I jumped out of bed and knocked on the door. Are you okay, Carr? I asked. She gathered her strength and answered, Yes, I'm fine. I'll be right out. When she came out and sat on the edge of the bed, she looked a little pale. Maybe I caught some kind of virus, she said. This is the third time this week that I've had morning sickness. It kind of reminds me of Tracy's pregnancy with the girls, and she fell silent and looked at me with an expression that mixed fear and delight. I didn't need mind-reader abilities to understand where this was going. Wait, I thought you couldn't get pregnant, let alone carry a child to term, I said with a quiver in my voice. We never used protection for this reason. The doctor never said I couldn't get pregnant. It was just that the chance of it was very low. He called it a one in a million chance, and the chance that I would be able to carry the baby to term was the same. Wow, was all I could get out. We jumped in the shower, and for the first time since we started our friends with benefits relationship, we didn't have sex in the shower. We were both preoccupied with other things. We made coffee and toast in silence. After pouring the coffee and buttering the toast, we sat down at the kitchen table instead of sitting in front of the TV as usual. Look, I don't believe in abortion except in emergency situations, but I'm not the one who has to carry this baby. I began, but I will be there for you through everything, and I will support this child with both love and finances if you decide to keep him, and by some miracle you are able to carry him to term. I mean, I will always be there for you, even if one of us or both will end up getting married again. Karen started crying, and I walked over to her and hugged her tightly. She then began to sob uncontrollably. I just let her talk. Maybe this is God's way of balancing the score, the ultimate way of retribution, for ruining your marriage, she finally said. If that's the case, then he really does have a sense of humor. She smiled at me, and suddenly the world seemed a little brighter. We got dressed and spent the day out, first visiting an art gallery, then a craft show, and finally going out to dinner. Over the course of the day, we both came up with a bunch of little things we needed to do if Karen was actually pregnant. We bought a home pregnancy test, and it confirmed that Karen was pregnant. A visit to her OBGYN a couple of weeks later finally confirmed this, and the doctor explained to both of us the risks of carrying Karen's baby. Karen didn't blink when she told the doctor that not only would she carry the baby to term, but that it would be a perfect, beautiful, healthy baby. I owe you this, she told me as the doctor looked puzzled. Karen had never told anyone in her family about our relationship before, and given the way my marriage ended, I was more than okay with that. But she wanted to make a big splash with the news, and she wanted me there. I suppressed my personal feelings and went with her to her parents' house for a family reunion. Her parents, Tracy and Dave, who married after Karen and Dave's divorce, were present, as were several other aunts and uncles. It was something like cake and coffee, and different children were running around the house. We were the last to arrive at her parents' house, and when I followed Karen in, it was dead silent, at least until my ex-mother-in-law found her voice. What he doing here? She said with contempt, literally dripping from her words. I think the father of your next grandchild should be here to make the announcement, Karen said coldly. I just stood there with the biggest grin I could muster. The room practically exploded into a cacophony of shocked statements. My ex-mother-in-law went from bitch mode to grandma mode in the blink of an eye, bursting into tears of happiness. I noticed shocked faces and smiles everywhere until I looked at Tracy and Dave. Tracy looked stunned and Dave gritted his teeth and blushed. The next thing I knew, my ex-father-in-law grabbed me by the shoulder and led me into the kitchen. He didn't look happy. Is this how you got back at Tracy? He growled. Wow, wow, wow! Take it easy! I snapped at him. Tracy and I have been divorced for over seven years. She has three children with Dave and married him. And Karen came to me and not the other way around. Jerry sat down on the kitchen chair looking confused, 
while the noise in the living room continued to be at a good level. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but Karen and I have been friends and have been on benefits since she split with Dave. Because no one thought Karen could get pregnant, we never used birth control. It just happened. No, we're not getting married, but I care about Karen very much. And I intend to be every bit the father to this child that I am to Jeremy and Sandy. Then I guess I need to shut my stupid mouth and congratulate you two, he said as he stood up, shook my hand, and then pulled me in for a manly hug. Wait, I have the perfect way to celebrate, he said, reaching into the drinks cabinet above the refrigerator. He pulled out a bottle of 18-year-old single malt whiskey and poured each of us a glass. He led me back into the living room and suddenly the room became quiet again. Everyone looked at the two of us. Lee shame, Jerry exclaimed. The noise resumed. We clinked glasses quietly, then sipped scotch. You don't pour an 18-year-old single malt down your throat no matter the occasion. It's amazing how quickly my position in the family grew. Even though Tracy cheated on me, I was still the bad guy for stopping her from doing her good deed and getting a divorce years ago. But suddenly, I became a hero for accidentally getting Karen pregnant. The irony is not lost on me. I saved up vacation and work time and used it for Karen's doctor visits and such. And when they decided to have a Caesarean section a little earlier, at 34 weeks, I was in the room with her. Knowing that I was part of a miracle lifted my spirits and I handled the whole birth as easily as I did in my 20s when Tracy had two children. Miracle Platt was perfect, beautiful, and healthy when he was born. I didn't think about it at the time, but before I closed my eyes and fell asleep that night, I wondered what Dave must have thought about Karen and I having a son. Call me a cruel bastard, but I smiled to myself as I fell asleep. Between my two eldest and the baby, Life in general has been quite busy and happy for me. Karen and I still spent weekends together, although she started taking pills after Miracle was born. We both agreed that one was enough. Two more years passed and I was happy with my life. At this point, I hadn't been on a date since Karen and I became a duo almost four years ago, and I wasn't looking for a woman. However, apparently, Karen was looking for a woman. For me. Sunday night, before taking Miracle home, Karen said we needed to talk, so we sat in the living room while Miracle played on the floor in front of us. She looked more than a little nervous, and I had a bad feeling that my happy life was about to change. I know we've moved past the role I played in your divorce years ago, but I still feel like I owe it to you. So next Friday night, you're going on a date with my friend, co-worker actually. I started to protest, but she gave me her hand with a stop sign, so I shut up and listened. Roger, you have become my favorite person in the world, my best friend, my lover, the father of my child. I love you, but you are absolutely the right husband for the right woman. And after years of searching, I think I've found the right one for you. I searched long and hard, and I never wasted your time asking you to go on dates with women I thought might be good for you. But I've known this woman for ten years. I've seen her deal with a lot of worse situations in life including the death of her husband from cancer seven years ago, and she showed me the same thing you showed me. Tremendous strength of character. She finally started dating again just last year, and I think you two are great for each other. She knows about our relationship, but I told her, as I am telling you now, that I would gladly make way for you too, as long as I can still remain a part of your life as a friend. When Karen finished speaking, Tears welled up in her eyes. I had tears in my eyes. I can't make you any promises, babe, but I'll do my best, I whispered. Sherry Langford was everything Karen said she was, and more, so much more. At 48, she was two years older than me, but I would guess she was five years younger than me. She had flawless mocha skin, the product of an English father and an African-American mother, shoulder-length dark brown hair, a beautiful face, and a toned hourglass figure. I took her to a nice Italian restaurant a couple of towns away. Over the course of three courses, she told me most of her story, and I told her most of mine. She was incredibly easy to talk to and sounded like a very smart person. Perhaps because she knew me so well, 
Karen somehow found what my soul had been missing since I broke up with Tracy. Within three dates, I knew Sherry was right for me, and I think she felt I was right for her. I explained to Karen that we needed to end the sexual part of our relationship, and she smiled back at me with a smug look that said, I told you so. We still got together from time to time. We were still good friends and had a child together, but she no longer spent the night. A year later, we got married in a small ceremony. She was given by her son, John, who became not only my stepson, but also a reliable friend. And for my best man, well, she was actually a woman. It felt right that Karen was there for me. Sherry completely understood my friendship with Karen, considering she was another close friend of Karen's, and the three of us often did things together, especially baby things with Miracle. Mama Sherry quickly became one of my son's favorite people. I'm not saying life was perfect, but we were very happy and I had few complaints. Except for one Miracle fifth grade social studies teacher who gave my child a failing grade on his genealogy project, she seemed to have a little trouble understanding his tree. Damn, I live it and it's hard for me to follow it. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.